So obviously, if we're gonna be doing this, we need to be Julius Caesar, right? Welcome to the Siege of Alexandria. Run, Caesar, run. Among the collection of writings attributed to Julius Caesar are his descriptions of the Siege of Alexandria, the Gallic Wars, and the commentaries on the Civil War. These archives contain information on different campaigns, the Wars of Alexandria, Africa, and Spain. Each of them recounts Caesar's military activity from 58 BCE to 45 BCE. Though Caesar's documents remain a main source of information, it's important to note that the perspective is limited. It is necessary for other historical documents to be taken into consideration to provide a better understanding of events. The Siege of Alexandria closely relays the events of the Civil War that led up to the event and describes how Caesar was besieged in the palace of the Ptolemies. Other ancient authors have left equally valuable and sometimes contradictory information. In the events leading up to the siege of Alexandria, Cleopatra VII and her brother were fighting over control of Egypt. Young King Ptolemy XIII's regent, Pothinus, had firm control over the young pharaoh, and an outmaneuvered Cleopatra soon went into hiding. This set the stage for Pompey's arrival in Alexandria. Having lost his battle against Caesar in 48 BCE, the Roman general turned to his allies, the Egyptians, for safe harbor. But on the advice of Pothinus, Ptolemy XIII had Pompey assassinated in the hopes of earning Caesar's favor. This would turn out to be a most unfortunate decision. Upon his arrival in Alexandria, Caesar was presented with Pompey's head. The sight of a Roman murdered by Egyptians did not sit well with him. Caesar made his displeasure clear, ordering the return of Cleopatra and for the siblings to resolve their differences and resume their co-rule of Egypt, as per the will of their father. Neither Pothinus nor Ptolemy XIII wished to accede to this demand. While doing his best to aggravate Caesar, Pothinus secretly plotted against the Roman ruler and sent word for Egyptian general Achilles to bring his 20,000 men to fight on his behalf. While Pothinus plotted against Caesar, Cleopatra made a bold move. Well, wow, quite a journey to the next step. Out of the way, Caesar coming through. What's this? Yeah, I thought I saw one of these. Oh, that's for a soldier, not for Caesar. <laughs> what the heck? Oh, these are all spots for like soldiers to stand, huh? Oh, these are protesters. These are spots from the game, aren't they? Like the main game. And those are things that the models are trained to do in that spot. Hello, Roman guard.
There are various descriptions of the encounter between Caesar and Cleopatra. One report states that she snuck into the palace alone at night. Another account claims she was accompanied by an ally and was brought inside the palace wrapped in a carpet bag. Though exactly what happened at this fateful meeting is up for debate, what is known is that Cleopatra met with Caesar and earned his approval. Pothinus and Ptolemy XIII were most vexed with this turn of events. It's awfully weird for Caesar to see Caesar. Hey, imposter. Out of my way. <laughs> Can I sit in the throne? No. With Cleopatra finally present, Caesar chose to act as mediator between the siblings in the hopes of a peaceful resolution. It did not take long for things to sour. During a banquet given to celebrate the reconciliation, there was an assassination attempt on Caesar. It was the Roman leader's own barber who thwarted the attack. Once it was revealed that the king's regent, Pothinus, had ordered the attack, Caesar had him executed. He then placed the young king under guard. <laughs> Caught within the palace with roughly 4,000 troops and with the knowledge that the arrival of enemy forces was imminent, Caesar sent for help from Syria, Rhodes, and Cilicia. He ordered his men to dig a ditch around the palace and build a wall leading to the harbor. This would ensure Caesar's access to the sea. When Egyptian General Achilles arrived in the city with 20,000 men, the battle for Alexandria began. Hmm. So we had enough time to build a wall and a trench. We didn't have enough time to just go to the sea beforehand. With so few men at his disposal, Caesar could not risk a battle just yet. He sent ambassadors to Achilles in the name of Ptolemy to propose a truce. Knowing that the orders did not come from the young king and angered by the pharaoh's imprisonment, Achilles had the messengers assassinated. With Caesar confined within the palace, Achilles positioned his troops around the city. Skirmishes broke out throughout the streets of Alexandria and went on for several days and nights. Though they were outnumbered, Caesar's men were able to hold the enemy back. This prompted Achilles' next move, capture the Roman fleet stationed in the harbor. <laughs> Mm 
be really nice if I had a horse right about now. But you can't steal horses. Wow, that's a really terrible thing to say to the emperor. In the game, you can just like rip someone out of a horse or a camel and jump on it. But apparently not in this. You have to find one that no one's riding. And there's one right there. Two, now three. But I'm already here. <laughs> Although the palace offered protection, losing the port meant the end of help and supplies. Caesar knew he had to protect the fleet. While he and his troops succeeded in regaining control of the port, he knew it would be impossible to sustain. Caesar ordered the burning of the ships. With passage back to the palace closed off, he headed for the lighthouse of Alexandria. Fighting their way through the Egyptian troops, Caesar and his men eventually reached Ferris Island. There, they took refuge within the lighthouse. With easy access to the open sea, Caesar was able to send messages to his allies requesting reinforcements and more supplies. The island fort also allowed him to control access to the harbor by relying on the chains used by the Egyptians to control ship traffic to and from Alexandria's docks. The exact chronology of events during the war in Alexandria remain imprecise. Conflicting accounts raise questions as to when, and even if, the Great Library of Alexandria was burned down at all. One account states that during the fighting, docks and warehouses were burned, and this was the fire that spread to the library. In another account, when Achilles cut off the harbor, Caesar had to leave the safety of the palace to defend his ships. As the enemies battled across the port, their arsenal set ships ablaze, and this destruction spread to the library. Yep. In either case, the Great Library was not completely destroyed. Experts point out that its location was too far from the harbor, and much later texts refer to the Great Library as being intact. Warehouses near the harbor contained manuscript copies awaiting export, and it is more likely that these documents were destroyed than the Great Library itself. The destruction of the Great Library may have been due to a number of fires over the ages. Its end was probably closer to the 4th century CE, when the Christian Emperor Theodosius I ordered the closure of all pagan temples. While some documents survived after being moved away, it remains unclear just what knowledge may have been lost. Where there are accounts of Achilles being in control of the battle against Caesar, it appears that instead Cleopatra's sister, siding with her brother, had him killed and put her ally Ganymedes in his place. Ganymedes proved a valuable tactician for the Egyptian side. It was his idea to cut Caesar's access to the harbor, thus trapping Caesar at the palace. During the time of Ptolemy I, canals had been dug throughout Alexandria to provide fresh water. Ganymedes had his men take control of these canals. After isolating their own water supply, he had his men pour salt water into the canals and cisterns that led to Caesar's camp. Yeah.
Panic erupted in Caesar's men. They wouldn't last long without fresh water. Recognizing that the porous limestone could help them, Caesar and his men dug wells to restore their water supply. Days later, the 37th Legion, comprised of Pompey's soldiers, arrived by ship. Unable to come ashore due to the winds, Caesar risked going out to meet them on the peninsula, Cape Chersonese. When the enemy learned Caesar's location, they rushed to intercept. Despite an obvious advantage for the Alexandrians, Caesar, with a Rhodian ship full of skillful sailors, emerged victorious. With help from the Allied ships, Caesar's victory enabled him to push the Egyptians back and secure the lighthouse. Gaining control of Ferris Island sent the Alexandrians into the sea and swimming back to the city. However, Caesar's fortification of the island didn't last long. The enemy regrouped and were set to storm the island. Panic-stricken, in spite of Caesar's encouragement, many of his men then fled their posts either by ship or jumping into the sea. Caesar attempted to retreat, but Port Eunostos' harbor was overrun with enemy ships, preventing escape. Reportedly, Caesar gathered his papers and leapt overboard in an attempt to swim to an allied ship farther out. Historian Cassius Dio claimed that Caesar would have drowned if he hadn't been able to remove his purple garment. Still, he managed to swim the distance and survive. The Alexandrians recovered the cloak and used it as a trophy to commemorate the Roman debacle. Unhappy with Ganymedes and wanting their king restored, the Alexandrians approached Caesar with a compromise. Caesar agreed to release Ptolemy XIII after entreating him to spare the kingdom and remain loyal to Rome. Once freed, however, the king defied the agreement and continued the war. By this time, a faithful ally of Caesar's, Mithridates, arrived in Egypt, clashing with Ptolemy's troops at Pelusium. Outnumbering the enemy, Mithridates secured the region between Pelusium and Alexandria. Ptolemy, warned of Caesar's ally marching on Alexandria, sent his troops to prevent passage over the river. Yep. Mithridates warned Caesar in time, and the two groups confronted the armies of Ptolemy in the delta. In the Battle of the Nile, the Romans gained the upper hand, sending the Egyptians fleeing. In the tumult and panic, King Ptolemy XIII drowned in the Nile. After the siege ended, Cleopatra VII married her younger brother, Ptolemy XIV, enabling her to reign over Egypt until 30 BCE. Under her rule, Alexandria settled into its position within the Roman Empire and eventually surpassed Athens as one of the most important cities in the Roman Empire. Julius Caesar remained in Egypt for a short time. He and Cleopatra would later have a son named Caesarion. All right, that was a long tour. Yep. Still want to do this one though.
There's no fast travel there. the heat that gets you. Well, it might, if the miles and miles of endless barren desert without water don't first. <laughs> Thanks, that's so encouraging. So now we're Cleopatra because we are going to learn about Cleopatra. Welcome to Cleopatra, Queen of Egypt. Cleopatra VII Theophilopater ascended the throne in 51 BCE at the age of 18. Though her early attempts to maintain power were often challenged, she eventually prevailed and became the sole ruler of Egypt. According to Plutarch, she was the only Ptolemaic pharaoh to speak the Egyptian language. Her intelligence, coupled with a good education and a great political mind, allowed her to make the alliances necessary to maintain the independence of Egypt while Rome was becoming a Mediterranean empire. holding the food? It is important to understand that Cleopatra's knowledge of Egyptian language and keen understanding of the culture allowed her to make powerful ideological reference that resonated with ancient Egyptians. By associating herself with the goddess Isid, the divine mother, great of magic, and repository of divine essence, Cleopatra firmly established herself as the protector of the two lands and legitimized her place on the throne. Moving the camera slowly is difficult, so that's why it's not very I'm trying to do that. Upon his death in 51 BCE, Ptolemy XII Aulus bequeathed his kingdom to his daughter and eldest son, Cleopatra VII and Ptolemy XIII. As was custom, the siblings were married. The new pharaoh was 10 years old, his sister wife, 17. The early years of their reign were not easy. Between 50 and 48 BCE, droughts and floods aggravated Egypt's problems. General Achilles and the royal advisor Pothinos kept intervening in the young ruler's political decisions and eventually colluded to turn Ptolemy XIII against Cleopatra. By 48 BCE, Cleopatra was in exile. During Cleopatra's exile, the Roman Empire was not without its own internal conflict. Caesar and Pompey were at war with one another, and after his defeat in 48 BCE, Pompey fled to Alexandria in the hope of finding refuge. This turned out to be an unwise decision. Listening to his advisors, Ptolemy XIII elected to have Pompey assassinated, his head kept as a gift in the hopes of acquiring Caesar's favor. This gambit backfired. Instead of earning approval, the murder of a Roman greatly angered Caesar. As you can imagine it would. It's me. Cleopatra, aware of Caesar's anger against Ptolemy for the murder of Pompey, decided to take advantage of the situation. 
she returned to Egypt in secret, hoping to establish an alliance with one of the most powerful men of the time. Outside of the legend, where she had herself smuggled into his quarters in a carpet, what exactly happened during that fateful meeting remains a mystery. However, Caesar seemed to see a better ruler for Egypt in Cleopatra than in her young and too easily influenced brother. Invoking Ptolemy XII's will, Caesar attempted to mediate peace between the siblings. <laughs> Ptolemy XIII was enraged by the turn of events, and his advisors were none too happy to see Cleopatra return. Urged on by General Achilles and Pothinos, the young pharaoh plotted against Caesar and Cleopatra, resulting in the siege of Alexandria in 47 BCE. It was in March 47 BCE that Caesar defeated Ptolemy XIII's forces. The young pharaoh drowned in the Nile after having fled the battlefield. With her opponents dead or powerless, Cleopatra married her other much younger brother, Ptolemy XIV, and finally claimed the throne of Egypt for good. The end of the Alexandrian War also cemented the romantic and political alliance between Cleopatra and Caesar. <laughs> In June of 47 BCE, Cleopatra gave birth to a son, whom she called Caesarian. Caesar did not accept the boy as his heir, choosing instead his nephew Octavian. Nonetheless, on his return to Rome, Caesar invited the queen and her brother husband to stay in the city. Her presence still drew much disapproval from the Senate. Always a strategist, Caesar left four legions in Egypt and a man he trusted to direct Egyptian affairs, giving him control of the wheat supplies essential to Rome. Cleopatra and her entourage remained in Rome until March 44 BCE, when Caesar was murdered. Caesar's most faithful ally, Mark Antony, often visited the Queen of Egypt during his stay in Rome. Unlike most, he recognized the legitimacy of Caesarion, the natural son of Caesar. Antony knew he would need the riches of Egypt in order to fight Octavian and claim the Roman Empire. Cleopatra, in return, saw a powerful ally. In the winter of 41 BCE, she arranged a sumptuous tour of Egypt by boat to show Antony the wealth of her country and the power she held as its ruler. A romantic and political relationship followed. The Roman Senate was once again most displeased. To calm spirits in Rome, Antony married Octavia, sister of Octavian. Very creative naming going on by the Romans, huh? Despite his marriage to Octavia, Antony remained Cleopatra's lover, and she gave birth to their children. Cleopatra increased her kingdom's territory and started a political propaganda alongside her lover in Egypt and beyond. She hoped to create a Ptolemaic federal empire with Alexandria at its center. Antony eventually repudiated his Roman wife for the Egyptian queen, much to the dismay of the Roman elite. However, while Mark Antony focused on Egypt, Octavian carefully gained military and political ascendancy over him in Rome. Octavian managed his own propaganda campaign and succeeded. The Roman people hated Mark Antony and Cleopatra. To avoid the censure still inherent in attacking a fellow Roman, Octavian simply declared war against Egypt. Rome's power still reigned supreme. The powerful Egyptian fleet, led by Cleopatra as well as Mark Antony's forces, were defeated in 31 BCE 
in Actium. Octavian arrived in Egypt in 30 BCE to formalize his victory. The following events remain difficult to confirm due to the many versions and legends around them. It is believed that after hearing a rumor about Cleopatra's suicide, Mark Antony committed suicide himself. He was brought to the queen as he slowly passed away. Knowing that Octavian would have her chained and paraded through Rome in defeat, <laughs> Cleopatra planned her own suicide. She most likely killed herself with arsenic, though admittedly the version where she uses an asp to deliver a fatal bite may be considered more dramatic. What happened to the body of Cleopatra is still a mystery. Hmm. Oh, there's the snake. Lower right, lower left, excuse me. In the lower right, that's a woman on the floor. On the lower left, there's a snake. There's an instrument down there, but you can see the snake too. The reason I was laughing is because this scene clearly depicts Cleopatra as dead. But you can see she just she's doing it again right there. She, she reaches her hand up and scratches her face. <laughs> and then goes back to being dead. What the heck? That's hilarious. Uh. All right, what tour is next? That one here. The Greek pharaohs. Hmm. This place is really gorgeous. And this whole game is gorgeous, but some areas are definitely better looking than others. Take your time. I'll wait. It's not like ancient Egypt is going anywhere. Okay, I, you know, that was funny like the first couple times. Like the first two times. But now it's no longer funny. Is that something I can turn off maybe? It's actually pretty dumb because if you were to use this in the classroom environment, you'd have to mute it in between um, events because the stupid narrator talks like that. Could just fast travel there and probably should, but part of the joy of this game is just exploring, you know? Find a lot of cool new stuff that way. Welcome to the Greek Pharaohs.
pharaohs were considered divine incarnations of the gods. As an avatar of the gods living on earth, the pharaoh's role was to preserve fundamental values and universal harmony by removing chaos, easefet, and ensure that justice, mot, prevailed. The pharaoh, by divine ancestry and through multiple offerings, was the bond that unites the world of men to the world of the gods and allows the maintenance of the cosmic order. The Ptolemaic dynasty reigned over Egypt from 305 BCE to 30 BCE. The dynasty was called the Ptolemies of the Lagids in recognition of the founder of the dynasty, Ptolemy Lagos, a Greek general and close friend of Alexander the Great. While Macedonian, Ptolemy Lagos understood that to be accepted by the Egyptian people, he would have to adopt their traditions. Upon assuming the title of Pharaoh, he changed his name to Ptolemy I Soter, meaning savior. Born in 356 BCE, Alexander the Great went through a hasty education in the affairs of the kingdom before integrating into the Macedonian army, where he quickly rose through the ranks. After his father's assassination in 336 BCE, which some believed was orchestrated by Alexander himself, he became king of Macedonia. Ruler of a unified kingdom and leader of a large army, Alexander set his sights on conquest. Eager to reclaim the Greek cities of Asia Minor, he took on the Persian forces, earning victory after victory. This is really cool. Nobody, I don't know if the tour might say this, but nobody really knows where Alexander the Great was buried. So this is just the game's version of where he was, at least at one point, here in Alexandria. I mean, it's believed that he probably was buried in Alexandria because he made the city, it was his city, you know, but... Can you actually go, yeah. You can actually explore this area. Story spoilers, I should say. <laughs> you haven't played the game and you want to. Ever victorious, Alexander the Great marched on, laying siege to city after city until he reached Egypt, where the Persians were defeated yet again. Viewed as a liberator by the Egyptian people, Alexander decided to become Pharaoh in due form. He traveled to Thebes to make a sacrifice to Apis, then went to the oasis of Siwa, where he was proclaimed son of Amun. Officially Pharaoh of Egypt, Alexander spent much of the winter there and founded the city of Alexandria. Perhaps not coincidentally, being Pharaoh allowed Alexander to spread propaganda to prepare further conquests. He resumed his military campaigns in 331 BCE. On his deathbed in 323 BCE, Alexander the Great gifted the satrapy of Egypt to Ptolemy Lagos. Perfectly aware of the value of Egypt, Ptolemy ensured not only the stability of the country's borders, but also its economic and military development. At the same time, he worked with the Egyptian elite to maintain the internal order of the country. By 305 BCE, Ptolemy, well respected both in Egypt and in the Mediterranean was at the head of the largest fleet of the Hellenistic world. Ptolemy officially took the title of Pharaoh of Egypt in January 304 BCE on the anniversary of Alexander the Great's death. Alexander died in Babylon in 323 BCE. His remains were placed first in a solid gold sarcophagus and then within another. The casket was carried in an ornate custom wagon, gilded and set with precious stones, and pulled by 64 mules crowned with gold. The funeral procession was diverted to a grandiose temple in Alexandria, built in the conqueror's honor under the orders of Ptolemy I.
Julius Caesar visited Alexander's tomb at the capture of Alexandria, and the Roman Emperor Augustus reportedly placed flowers there. However, though many powerful leaders claim to have visited it, the tomb's location has gone missing from history. Some accounts do state that the golden coffin was replaced by a glass sarcophagus, probably by Ptolemy X. It is also implied that Cleopatra may have plundered the tomb in a time of financial crisis. Thank you.